Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 530, and we are in Disneyland. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, trying to have the thought of George celebrating in brown shoes out of my mind, because it's the 6th of September, 2019, and we should think on things that are good and wholesome and proper. Holy, holy, yes. Holy, yes, yes, holy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, clergy, and laity alike, welcome to another program. Before we get started, I need you to do some things as faithful viewers and listeners to the program. We need you to like the show. If you don't like the show, we need you not to like the show. And you can do that on YouTube or Facebook by clicking the thumb up or thumb down. If you have not taken time yet to subscribe to this show and you're worried because you may not have watched the last episode, the latest episode that's out there, there's an opportunity for you to do that, and that's by subscribing to us on YouTube. Go to YouTube, click that little subscribe uh, rectangle in red, and then a little bell is going to show, just like the one on your screen right now. Click that as well, and you'll get instantly notified when YouTube is actually working of a new show that comes on. Also, the best part of Unscripted is... Well, clearly the episode you're listening to, but it's also the comments. People go right after they hear what we say and they run in, oh, I got a comment because George was so right on this and Gavin, he, he nailed that. And well, Kevin, he, he created a word and that's not really a word. So go to comments, uh, fill them out, and it's, it's where the show continues. We also have a podcast. Now, most people like looking in our faces. We keep them clean shaven and And uh, we're we're good-looking folks for our (coughs) mid-30s. And if that's just too much for you, you can listen to us on podcast. You can find those in the show notes. I must say, having a drunk man walk into a cathedral in England, look at the putt-putt golf, and say, this isn't effing Disneyland, made my year. Gavin. (laughs) <laughs> wow. George, George said something very just in the show pre-show about uh, that it was resonant of, of, the, of the demons uh, getting upset when Jesus ca- came near them, saying, what have you got to do with us? This was a kind of reverse spirituality in a way. This, this was a, a, a drunken man in the flesh who was sufficiently drunk to realize that, that the world had become disordered and that cathedrals should not be Disneyland. And it, it took a drunk man <laughs> to tell the cathedral authorities that, that, that Disneyland did not belong inside a cathedral. Because, and drunk, this man was wiser than the clergy were sober. And, and, and you know, the moment you hear it, you know it. Uh, it was a, well, l- like you, I had this huge relief. Oh, someone's telling the truth. Shame he had to get drunk to do it, but in vino veritas sometimes. <laughs> well, it, it, scripture tells us when we're in our in our darkest places, we do see the most real part of God sometimes. And uh, uh, I, I was not amazed; I was well pleased with with hearing this man's uh, decree within the cathedral grounds. Um, also, some strange things that we need to talk about before we go too far, because we've talked about it before. Brexit. Uh, there has been a. By go too far, you mean in time, not not intensity. Into what you know, we, we talk about. It. So we've had a Boris Brexit bomb this last week, and I thought uh, you, as a parliamentarian of sorts, because that's your government, could help explain what happened. Because when Boris made it as uh, prime minister, I thought, well, okay, it can't be too hard from here to get. A, a nice lawful exit from the European Union. Wrong. What happened? I can give you the broad brush, and, and, and George, in his scholastic integrity, has has the Hansard detail because he's been reading it word for word. The broad brush is that, that many people won't yet have grasped that there are two forms of democracy fighting each other. There's representational democracy, which is when you elect an MP, and you said you're free to have your own thoughts, but you do it in our name. And there's direct democracy when you say... We, the people, want this to happen. 
so we live in a representational democracy when we elect MPs and they go and spend five years doing their own thing and get to be accountable once every five years. But they made the mistake of introducing direct democracy with a referendum, which is, if you like, a purer kind of, of a democracy, especially for a single purpose uh, issue. So the single purpose issue is leave the EU. But the direct democracy people said, no, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to think for ourselves. So both claim to be Democrats. Both claim to be pursuing their their. Uh, their sense of integrity. It's just that the, the politicians think they know best and say that they know best, and the people are getting cross. And and again, the interesting thing is that so often the very people who are accusing others of something are doing it themselves. So very often when people, when the progressive left accuse others of hate, they are in fact hating and their accusation is an act of hate. Uh, and in this case, um, the progressives said Boris Johnson has initiated a coup. No soldiers, no tanks, <laughs> no police on the streets to speak of. There was indeed a coup, but it was their coup. It was engineered by the Speaker of the House of Commons, who is required to be impartial, but was partiality of an extreme kind, using his position to force the government to accept business they would not otherwise have accepted. And so because Boris Johnson lost his majority, he's become effectively impotent in parliament is, 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 a, is a prisoner of being in government but without any power to act. So now every, everyone is trying to work out, it's a bit like a game of cards and, and who has the Trump card? Um, nobody knows where the Trump card lies down, down the, the pack and we're waiting to see, uh, we won't know till near the end of the process, who's going to win. I'm finding it terribly depressing, so much so that I don't want to read the newspapers every day. But George has been working out where the Church of England is in all this and the role that it's been playing. <laughs> I, I'm uniquely placed because I really don't care about the outcome. Uh, the, uh, but I enjoy watching the sport nonetheless. And the, uh, conserve, the government of uh, Prime Minister Johnson uh, had an interim measure that they lost the vote in the House of Commons when I believe it was 21 or 27 members of the Conservative Party crossed and voted with the opposition, uh, but basically defeating the government. Now, normally that would trigger a uh, no confidence, and the prime minister would resign and the, could go to the country with new elections and so on. At the same time, the Labour Party and the opposition are not willing to allow elections because David Cameron, who I believe on the merits was one of it, probably the second worst prime minister of this century. Uh, Theresa May does have that honor, I think, and will probably keep it for a, a good long time. He instituted a fixed term parliament, five years, whereas before, if the government fell, they'd be dissolved. And the only way to overcome that is a two thirds vote. Well, the opposition is in a wonderful position of having its opponent, if you will, in boxing terms, in the in the corner, and the it tied up in the ropes, and it's pummeling it in the head, and the referee isn't looking, mm -hmm. and it can it can refuse an, a, a general election, yet at the same time it can uh, make the government impotent. So in essence, it it can create paralysis for its own political ends, which is what it's done. Now, the Johnson government wanted to see if they could do anything in the House of Lords to stop this. So conservatives put forward oh, over a hundred amendments and the rules were that each one has to be voted on twice and has debate. And they began this process and they soon realized that the non Nigerians in the House of Lords, the, the old conservative peers couldn't stay up past seven o'clock at night. And it, this wasn't going to work. Now, five, bishops of that Church of England took part in these series of debates, which were designed essentially to frustrate the House of Commons vote. And so the bishops of London, Birmingham, Leeds, Ely, and Southwark all voted against the government again and again and again and again, in line with the opposition, in line with the, the mindset of the in England's elites. So the Church of England uh, is basically coming out through its bishops being four square in back of the uh, uh, Remain party. And it's d demonstrated this uh, in the votes in the House of Lords. Now, let me just sort of step up in a second. Um, for, for the English, this is life and death. This is, for the British, this is a very major pressing issue. But there are two worldviews here. The f first worldview is of the, of the Bishop of London, 
where Britain is essentially like Belgium. It's part of the EU, it's a European country, and Belgium periodically goes through a period of a year, two years, where it has no functional government. The Walloons and the Flemings are at each other's throats, and neither has majority, and therefore there's no prime minister, and the civil service carries on until the crisis is resolved. And Britain, in the mindset of the Bishop of London and her peers, that's just the way Britain is from this point on. We, we, we don't really have ultimate decision-making authority because we've shopped it out to the EU. And then there are the hard conservatives who are saying Britain is a sovereign nation. We've been given a mandate by the people to accomplish this end. Yes, it was foolish of the government to, and the Labour Party to say this is how we're going to do it through direct action, through a referendum referendum, but nonetheless, we did it, therefore we should honor it. And so we have two worldviews that are irreconcilable on display here. Now, how it works itself out doesn't really matter, uh, but because it eventually will work itself out. Meanwhile, the mail will be delivered, uh, the taxes will be collected. The taxes and, will be collected. Uh, and uh, I think, life I think goes on. So the thing that surprised me most, um, I, I understand people who uh, are against Brexit and who want a European-wide consensus? It's it's a it's a perfectly reasonable position to take, uh, and and I wish they could understand that I feel that democracy is too diluted to be in safe hands in that position, um, and that would be a reasonable uh, process of discussion. What upsets me spiritually, because I think we need to bring this back to the kingdom of heaven, is not to say that the kingdom of heaven is on one side of the argument or the other, but but that that the, the people who are remaining have a monopoly of anger and hate. So the, the, the rage on the streets has been by Remainers who have accused Johnson of, of having a coup. Now, po politically, it could turn out in the mind of God that, that they have the, the best insight. They might. Um, but the spirit in which they're doing it is wrong. Uh, and, and whereas whatever the educational or psychological state of, of the Brexit people, they look upon the whole thing in a bemused way. We'd like to be not we'd like not to have you calumnify us, to be misunderstood, to be misrepresented. But why are you so angry? And it seems to me that spiritually the, the anger and the rage and the and the frustrations of power lie on one side. And therefore leaving aside the political issues at a level of spiritual discernment, I think there's something wrong at the roots of of the Remainer argument. It's it's the wrong spirit is what upsets me most. It's interesting because, you know, England has had centuries of monarchy, you know, under somebody else's authority, uh, to see this this fight over being under the EU's authority, uh, just from an outside political perspective, it's it's interesting to watch. Um we go through this. It's hard to believe that you know you guys are the land of the the Magna Carta. You know, sometimes you know. Well, that, one of the, one of the things that upsets me most, I think, is the infantilization of our culture in the last forty years. Yeah. Uh, that that the, the the generation under fifty and forty five has has been raised in this uh, in in a kind of quasi American, if I may say so, culture of therapeutic self pity uh, and an unwillingness to to. Uh, to, to grow up and to take responsibility. One, one, there is a sense of fear amongst those who, are, who are, want to remain inside the EU. They are afraid of taking responsibility and managing a relationship with the world. And I think that's why they're so angry. So again, I, I think that, that leaving aside the political argument, we don't know what's going to happen. In terms of process, I think that the, the spiritual flaws lie on one side more than the other. But I'm very happy to be told I'm, I'm wrong. This is not a matter that that my my heart is engaged with that level. That's that belongs to Jesus, um, and the it is a very difficult job indeed bringing Christ to the to, as an interpreter of a political situation. And I'm I'm really embarrassed about it because most of the time I tell my left wing friends who do it as a matter of course and are absolutely convinced that Jesus is a socialist. I warn them this is a dangerous path to follow, and here I am being lured down it. So I apologize. I could resist it more. This would be a good time for a transition. We're going to go from the despot of uh, European Union to the death of the, the despot of Zimbabwe. Uh, and I think it's important uh, to talk about because this guy was horrid. And what he did to his nation is one of just 
I just see pure hate, spiritual hate, physical hate. Um, and I know, George, you visited Zimbabwe a couple times, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, in it's, fact, Gavin and I, I think, were in Zimbabwe simultaneously at the World Council of Churches in, was it 98? No, we didn't know each other then, but yeah. we, all, we were, yes. G G Gavin would have been, of course, seated in the loony left bin while I was. <laughs> I was. I was a delegate from the world from General Synod, and uh, wow. you, you're quite right. I, George, I remember walking around the campus at nighttime trying to avoid craters that were the size of elephant traps and not fall down them <laughs> to my death. It was quite a dangerous time. Anyway, we were both there. I, I'm just going to move because I've discovered I've yet again forgotten to plug my laptop in, and it's threatening. <laughs> Let's go, Korea. Yeah, people enjoyed your movie last time, so we're going to keep it up. <laughs> Just don't bump anything over. So, George, tell us about uh, Robert Mugabe. Robert Mugabe, who was the president dictator of Zimbabwe since independence in 1980, who was ousted in military coup in 2017. He died yesterday, Thursday. And Robert Mugabe did every evil thing a dictator could do. Mass murder. Uh, not even talking about the war crimes of the uh, revolution. Uh, after he came to power, his political opponents within the African community, the Nadeli tribe, he uh, unleashed uh, uh, security battalions with North Green advisors to murder political dissidents. Tens of thousands murdered, uh, tens of thousands jailed. Uh, the economy destroyed. Zimbabwe, uh, Rhodesia worked. Uh, this is a politically incorrect thing to say. But the, st the standard of living was higher uh, before uh, Mugabe took power in 1980. Life expectancy was longer. The schools worked. The quality of education worked. Everything material worked better. What was lacking was political freedom, which the African majority did not have. Now the African majority still doesn't have political freedom because you're run by an oligarchy of uh, the ruling ZANU PF, uh, Zimbabwe African National Union Political Front political party, Mugabe's heirs, and they enrich themselves at the expense of the peasantry and the city dwellers. So you have an economy that is in shambles that is on par with Venezuela. You have, I remember in uh, 98, uh, Michael Nazarali was attending the uh, uh, Harare World Council of Churches meeting and he had a stroke or heart attack and he was rushed to a hospital in Harare and he received pretty good medical care. This is 98, 18 years after independence. Things had gone downhill, get, there were potholes in the streets, the power got shut off every so often, but there were well-trained uh, doctors, nurses, medical supplies. Hospitals today are where you go to die in Zimbabwe. You must bring your own food. You must bring, if you can get a bed, if you, if you can find a doctor, if you want to be treated, they're basically bus stations in what were former working hospitals. It has deteriorated that. So, so if Michael Nazarelli had a heart attack in Zimbabwe today, he'd have to be put on an air ambulance to be flown immediately someplace else, or he'd die because there's just nothing there. And Robert Mugabe claimed to be a Roman Catholic. He was a product of the mission school system. And the Catholic Church internationally would sort of be nice to him and sort of not really do anything. And actually one of the heroes in the whole Mugabe saga was the Anglican Church in Harare, which stood fast when one of his cronies became Bishop of Harare, Mulbert Kanunga who was a source of great writer's joy for me because I got to write about him for years. And Rowan Williams and the church in the province of Central Africa did the good thing, fought the good fight because and stood up for truth and fairness and justice and integrity against the Mugabe regime. Well, that evil man is now dead and I assume he's in hell unless there's some sign of repentance at the end. Uh, but the evils, race hatred, uh, that he inculcated in, into the culture of Southern Africa just take generations to undo. It's weird because I see uh, African leaders from a generation ago uh, today praising him and his leadership and how he was a, a great guy. Let me share, share a quick anecdote. Uh, I was uh, 
I was in Zimbabwe and I was with some students from Bishop Gaul Theological College, which is the Anglican Seminary in Harare. Mm -hmm. And I thought it'd be fun to go with, uh, you were sort of required to go to rallies every so often by the government. And I went with them to a rally and I heard the speaker say, kill the white man. And at that point I felt, felt very pink because I was one of the few white men in the crowd. And my, and my fellow colleagues turned to me and said, George, don't worry, we don't consider you white. Because you know that you know you're an honorary African uh, for this for these purposes today, but that is the culture of uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, first was kill the white man, then it was kill the Nadele, uh, Matabili people, then it was kill the these you know the this and that. Um, I remember. The, I remember George that. Uh, the World Council of Churches. Do well, you remember Mugabe came to address us? He was he was given the position of honor, uh, and I had, like you, I had been speaking to some local people, and I, I'd been talking to an anaesthetist missionary, a wonderful lady, in her eighties, who was still continuing to work as an act of self giving, to uh, to the people. I was astonished at the way in which Mugabe used skillful, seductive rhetoric to tell us that he was a good Christian, mm -hmm. and that we were criticize him and I, I remember knowing enough about him to know this was all lies but being astonished in his presence at the power of his self-presentation as virtuous and good and one of the things I think we're going to find ourselves talking about today is uh, is this difference between people who present themselves and what they stand for as good everyone does it but the required requirement to look and see what flows from who they are and what they do and in Mugabe's case it was it was pure evil. It, when Mugabe finished speaking, uh, he was interrupted several times with applause, and my radar went off by this applause because it was a certain type of applause where everybody claps in unison. A certain Eastern European the communist party story, yes. regime, yeah. where we all clap in unison, and the first person who stops clapping gets shot. Uh, for disloyalty. <laughs> no, I mean th these were the uh, my sensation. Because you know the the security police were everywhere, and they were the men in suits with with mirrors, sunglasses, with little earphones on, looking at everybody, taking pictures of everybody. Now I was obviously a foreigner in my tan Brooks Brothers seersucker tropical white suit, so I really didn't catch catch anybody's eye. But you know the uh, there was a palpable sense of evil about Robert Mugabe, covered by a seductive attractiveness that allowed the elites of the Western world, allowed the World Council of Churches to support sending arms mm. to Mugabe in, in the fight in the Civil War uh, after, you know, they're shooting down civilian airliners and still the World Council of Churches, the World Council of Churches, not the Russians, are sending money to support this civil war. Because Mugabe was that seductive of a person. It was a, it was a kind of political pornography. Yes. And that, we may we may use that i think we'll use that later on <laughs> what a great chance to transition to another story in the anglican world um as we talked a couple weeks ago uh jesus uh jesus can just, i before we do kevin can i yeah. just one of the things that really bothers one of the issues going now down, down in south africa is xenophobic violence mm. where foreigners are being targeted by lynch mobs and murdered in the streets now they're not murdering white uh, South Africans in that sense. White South Africans are being murdered anyway out in their farmsteads, but for political purposes. But Nigerian shopkeepers, Ethiopian shopkeepers, Malawian day laborers are being murdered by South Africans who are angry that there's 30% unemployment, that they that the promises of the uh, uh, post, the majority rule are not being played out. Some people are making a great deal of money, but it's not making its way down into the masses. And what we're and the Church of Nigeria has issued a call for the Nigerian government to intervene on behalf of Nigerians being murdered, and Archbishop uh, Tabo Makoba of Cape Town has called upon the president to protect foreigners. At the same time, I've been having conversations with clergy and lay leaders in South Africa, who are basically saying, "Yes, it's wrong to murder Nigerians when our real problems are white people." And my response is, "You cannot solve one hatred." By picking up another hatred, was, and in other words, it's in other words the the Mugabe that all the ills of this world can be blamed upon the British or the colonialists or this and that that 
politically that may be true i don't care but to say don't hate this person they hate that person to have clergy saying that's the way forward i find appalling well it is indeed and one of the things that struck me about it when you were mentioning it as we discussed matters was how i i, I rather wished i'd i'd known that there were calls to kill the white man coming at this level in South Africa a week or so ago, because that was the point in which the number of us were talking about Welby's emphasis on political reconciliation. And as I wrote uh, and, and maintained an argument saying, political uh, reconciliation is short termist. It doesn't deal with the fact that uh, human beings are flawed and unless they are converted and remade by the Holy Spirit, then anything you do is simply shifting the pieces round into a into the same pattern but different places and that's why we call people to be converted and born again and begin the process of sanctification um, and at this point a number of, of well-meaning Anglicans said to me you know you've, you've completely overlooked the miracle that Tutu managed to pull off in South Africa as pursuing the well esque uh, technique of reconciliation he brought world peace in South Africa and and I mean I said to them but without enough confidence yeah, but it's only ever one generation, if that. And, and here, as George is quite rightly saying, it, it wasn't even one generation or the, the very turmoil and hate-fueled xenophobia between white and black has returned. And what Tutu did was splendid, but short-term, and, and, and has become a, a political solution, not a Christian one. A Christian one involves a transformation of people, Politics involves a constant tinkering with systems and fails because people have to be transformed. There has been transformation of individual, of people, but there's not been a transformation of the South African culture. And the Tutu political experiment has failed. Uh, we've had a succession of South African archbishops who march in lockstep with the African National Congress. They're political archbishops who will not say anything negative about the government uh, that is in any way politically threatening. Uh, those people who bring out Tutu and the promises of reconciliation haven't been following the news for about 10 years now. You do not obtain peace by proclaiming peace. And one of the, the tactics of Justin is to proclaim the peace. And in South Africa, uh, Tutu proclaimed the peace. It, that's not what works. Uh, you can't proclaim it. The Old Testament, Jeremiah, I think, you know, proclaiming peace, peace, where there is no peace, just doesn't work. And this is my experience with the seminarians of Bishop Gall Theological College. George, we don't consider you white. Now, that wasn't a uh, political statement. Mm -hmm. I was a brother in Christ, where my, my racial or ethnic background was irrelevant to my fellowship with them, which was founded on Jesus Christ. They were sinners who were seeking the redemption through Jesus Christ. I was a sinner seeking the redemption through Jesus Christ. And I was neither not white nor black. I was a Christian and a brother. And this, if the absence of this and well-beism of seeking Christ rather than just seeking the mean or the median or accommodation or let's solve the issues for today and let tomorrow take care of itself. It's frankly a waste of time. It's not going to get any place. Well, and if, sorry, Kevin, go ahead. Well, Scripture does not tell us to seek first the peace. You know, we are to seek first the kingdom. And uh, when we get off track, we just look for these little mediums and masses and muses, and uh, we get a generation of uh, happiness, and then it all falls apart again. I'd like to make a small disclaimer and say that if we if we attack Justin Welby, <clears throat> I'd I'd like I'd like us to to criticise him as emblematic rather than I'd, you know, System, yeah, sure. Welby the emblem rather than Justin the Christian, right. because the, God alone knows Justin the Christian. But Welby the emblematic Archbishop uh, is attracting our attention because he stands for a certain kind of Christianity that 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 in in my in our opinion uh, is is so flawed as to uh, severely undermine the whole project. So one of the things that has been reported today is that he has been in an interfaith seminar where he's been sharing insights with Muslims and Hindus and other religions uh, and Buddhists um, ab about prayer. And, and this has been welcomed enormously by people who say, well, goodness me, look how broad-minded, inclusive, 
and, and pacific that this man is. This is just what we want from an archbishop. And my concern is that they, I don't think they know very much about Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam. Because if they did, they would understand the gulf that there is both in principle and practice between Christian prayer and and other religions. And this can sound like a form of, of proud imperialism, uh, but it is in fact the, the delightful cry of the person who's been blind and can now see. Um, the, the prayers of Hinduism are effectively a form of magic. They have to be practiced in exactly the right way in order to seduce the deity, uh, who will have a variety of different characteristics, to deliver the right kind of things for humanity. And if you're a good Hindu, there will be ways of explaining to each other uh, the, the precise niceties that must be observed to get the magic right to manipulate the god with a small g. Um, None of these other religions introduce you to the father. None of them introduce a relationship of, of, of being adopted as a child, of a co-worker for goodness and for salvation. Islam, prayer is a pretty brutal form of submitting yourself to the will of Allah, again by the recitation of certain phrases in order to get the right thing done in the right kind of way. And, and, and although Sufism complicates matters slightly, there is no sense of a relationship because God is unknowable. We are much too small and broken off. Now, how, again, uh, a Christian can, can, can say, there are things I learned about Islamic prayer that deepens my relationship with Jesus. When, when Jesus is the clarity and Allah lies in a mist of obscurity, now, either this means you don't understand Jesus or you don't pray, but 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 the relativism, sorry, George, I'll, I'll take 10 seconds more and then over to you. The, 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 the mistaken relativism that puts a relationship with Jesus as if it was another cultural expression of religiosity uh, that can be shared and insights can be gained is a profound misrepresentation of what Christianity is. I liken what Welby is doing to a form of religious pornography. Um, what do I mean by that? A, a offensive, obnoxious statement. Uh, in, in my pastoral work, I was dealing with a man this week who has uh, is afflicted by an addiction to pornography. And one of the things he told me was that pornography, he, he pursues pornography because it allows him to have a more fulfilling relationship sexually with his wife. And this is what Welby is doing with these prayers and these uh, references to false gods, it, this this glamour, this attractiveness, this creation of his own mind as to what he's worshiping, can no is n is not a opening to Jesus Christ. It's a block to Jesus Christ. Just as pornography is so destructive to a marital relationship, to healthy human flourishing and sexuality, this sort of now I'm not talking about mild civic interfaith intercultural things where we're all nice to each other i'm talking about welby's claim and francis did this too and frankly francis did this much more sophisticated way yes, he did. <laughs> Welby really is third rate if when you come to think about it uh compared to pope francis but they're both going the same direction mm -hmm. i begin with the premise that the hindu gods are real but i call them demonic and satanic and if you are seeking to find christ find God, your way to God the Father, you can only do that through Jesus Christ. If you introduce these demonic entities into your spiritual life, they will lead you to Satan and destruction. And if you knew Jesus Christ, if you had experienced God in Christ, th this whole it, it, it's the, the frippery, the foolishness, this total insubstantiality of this uh, interfaith crap when you know the living god is just so incredible to me and it makes me say i don't think you ever knew jesus if you could even if you can say this stuff and and george that strong phrase of yours needs a bit of theological explanation it's entirely correct how is it possible then that that uh, an invitation to deal with minor deities might lead you into satan and the answer is because it's it's a trajectory of power it, it's, it's a kind of Nietzschean uh, expression, philosophically, of the religious instinct by which you seek to gain power to get things to happen. Now, if you pursue that as a trajectory in the Western culture, that takes you towards black magic. 
That's what black magic intends to do. And, and we very, we, we much easily, more easily understand the link between Satanism and black magic because Satanism expresses itself in that sense. So it will sound very offensive to some people that the idea of treating deities um, of, of a variety of natures to get things done might be satanic. But in the end, any religious path that allows you to develop a sense of control and power like that leads you to the dark side and that's why theologically it's satanic and i think the point about pornography is well very well made um, one of the re I'm, I'm i'm one of the reasons why pornography ought not to hold attraction is because any sensible person will say this is not telling the truth this is not what happens when two rather flawed crumbly bumpy people uh, fall into an embrace with each other it's more like pantomime than it is like 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 what is being presented and that's the great flaw in pornography one has to say this is not telling me the truth this is feeding me a lie that i will be seduced by and again the difficulty i'm i, I think both in it, it it includes aspects of buddhism and islam and hinduism that at the heart there is a lie that because it's not taking one to the father in to, to whom whom one approaches um, having had the problem of unholiness sorted by the blood of the lamb uh, it, it takes one to uh, c.s lewis is very good about this he says people fail to understand in their heads that all the religions in the world with the exception of christianity have been invented by people so people sat buddha sat down and said here is my my my, my world view it comes from me uh, muhammad sat down and said here is allah it comes from me via an angel but that's a matter of of, of, of uh, argument um, uh, Hindu, not anymore. <laughs> Hindu, you know, the whole Hindu panoply uh, is natural religion invented by people. The one exception was the Jewish prophets, where God broke in from the outside. And Lewis is very good on this. He says, you know, do not dismiss Christianity and Judaism as another variant of religious experience when it's utterly unique. None of the others claim to have been broken into from the outside. They have all done it from inspired they would claim from the inside and so that's one of the reasons why at heart there is a degree of religious pornography in other religions because they tell you something that ultimately is not true and will not hold and now the real problem is if you know jesus and you know a little bit about uh, hinduism and buddhism and islam you sit back and you say once i was blind but now i can see i, I now see who the living creator is and this amazing relationship he invited me to come into by virtuous suffering on the cross you can't possibly then turn around and ask an imam what insights he can offer you from the quran into that when he will simply tell you that what he will tell you that what you've experienced is a lie and therefore you have to choose between the two lies one of them is true and it's not allah if you have experienced i have experienced christ I've also experienced the satanic and I have a difficulty in articulating what I'm the, the, the immensity of both of those things. And when I hear Justin Welby is, uh, pre, it was asked to preach and talk to the church in North India and South India. And what was his topic? Climate change. When, when we have Christian persecution, when we have the demonic, when we have pornography, for goodness sakes, I mean, the, the, the immensity, the overwhelming presence of, of evil in this world and of Christ, and you choose to go down these fetid swamps of irrelevancy and political correctness, to have five bishops in the House of Lords talk about Brexit, but not a single one say a thing about abortion. Not a single one talk about our society in Britain is corrupt and broken and we need to return to Jesus Christ. Oh, no, yeah. you have bishops going on and on about, oh God, the most inconsequential pablum. Or the attack on the Jews, which ought to any sane Christian and any sane member of European society ought to know that the moment any part of society turns on the Jews, you have an outbreak of evil in its most intense form at your doorstep. And their radars are entirely switched off. They pay no attention. They say nothing. They don't understand. And this whole abuse crisis that is destroying 
that has destroyed lives, that is destroying the integrity of the Church of England, it at its heart is satanic. Um, it's arisen out of a culture of sexuality that arose uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. And the where are the bishops? Where is Justin Welby? Where is he saying to those who have been destroyed by the influence of Satan within the church and its ministers and ministries? What do we get? We get self-protection, we get climate change, we get mosquito nets. Albeit for a drunk man who recognized and was <laughs> clearly brought up to be a prophet, uh, you know, it, England and the cathedrals are no longer uh, uh, operating as they should. I, for one, am waiting for Justin to come out and introduce us to his uh, rug that he prays on when he faces it towards Mecca. And now he prays five times a day. I think, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's how bad it is. Guys, it's 44 minutes of Unscripted today. <gasps> we just couldn't stop talking. Yeah, for, you know, September, slow news month, we do really well. Guys, I want to thank you for your time. I know that Gavin is busy today celebrating his dear wife's birthday. And can I do say clear up one misconception, Kevin? Sure, go ahead. Uh, Gavin said something that is patently false. Uh oh. I have never celebrated the Eucharist wearing brown shoes. No. Never. <laughs> it just so happens when I dress today, I put on my tan suit and I put on my brown shoes. I have mm -hmm. not celebrated at the altar today. Uh -huh. In 20 plus years of ordained ministry, I have never worn, I have only worn black shoes while celebrating at the altar. I can't say why. I just think there's something wrong with the idea of branches at the altar. But then, um, one one one's allowed to fail from time to time. One is, one's perception is not well, always. Scripture wrong. tells us that Jesus was wearing black sandals when he did the first one. So, it just makes sense. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and we need to be able to pray to tell the difference between Disneyland and the Kingdom of Heaven. This has been episode 530 on the 6th of September 2019.